So good afternoon. My name is Shachar Richter, and I'm going to chair this session. Uh, we have uh, three contributed talks. Uh, the first one is given by Professor Mark Hersam, nanomaterial heterostructures for uh, electronic and energy technologies. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Th thanks for coming. Hopefully this will work out okay with the mic. So today I'm going to tell you a bit about the work in our lab in the area of solution processed nanomaterials. So we use these solution processed nanomaterials to produce heterostructures, both bulk heterostructures and planar or layered heterostructures. And in particular, I'll give you some examples of where we're using these heterostructures in electronics and also energy technologies. The outline of my talk is shown here. I'll begin by introducing what I call monodisperse nanomaterials. I'll then move into some device applications that exploit these monodispersed nanomaterials. So you'll find that in these applications, the purity of the materials or the degree of monodispersity will lead to improvements in performance. The only problem with that strategy is that once your purities reach or approach 100%, you can't do any better than that. And as a result, all of your device metrics will asymptotically approach some limit. We've reached that limit in many cases, and as a result, if we want to go to the next level, uh, we have to then explore areas of higher level integration. By that, I mean using more than one material in your particular device technology. And this will lead to the heterostructure theme, which is the title of the talk. But first, let me give you some background on our materials. So before I talk about monodispersity, let me introduce polydispersity. Uh, polydispersity is a ubiquitous problem in nanomaterials. It results from the fact that nanomaterials have properties that depend upon size and shape. And as a result, if you have any distribution of size and shape in your nanomaterial population, then you'll have inhomogeneity in the resulting properties. And what that implies is that while you can always pick out one particular nanomaterial to study in a research laboratory, when you want to take that concept and generalize it commercially, you have a problem in that you can't produce a billion or a trillion of such devices that are all the same. This polydispersity problem is most famous for the single-walled carbon nanotube. The single-walled carbon nanotube can be defined by its chiral vector, which will define the circumference of the carbon nanotube. And if you take this chiral vector and you change it by one atom, you can have a discontinuous change in properties from metal to semiconducting. And this is, of course, a major problem if you're trying to build a transistor and a third of your devices are shorted out because they are metallic. And as a result, uh, since there's no current means of synthetically controlling the structure with atomic precision, you have to develop a post-synthetic method for separating these materials by size, shape, and therefore properties. The way we do this in our lab is to borrow a method from biochemistry called density gradient ultracentrifugation, or DGU. In this method, what you do is you load a centrifuge tube with an aqueous or water-based solution where you introduce an additive as a function of depth. That additive will allow you to tune the buoyant density of the aqueous solution itself. So if you have a high concentration of that additive at the bottom of your centrifuge tube, you'll have a high buoyant density. If you have a low at the top, low concentration, you have a low buoyant density. And as a result, you can create a gradient in the buoyant density of the aqueous solution. If you then load a nanomaterial population dispersed with appropriate surfactants, turn on your centrifuge, that will drive sedimentation through the gradient until your nanomaterial's density matches that of the gradient, the so-called isopicnic or equal density point. And once it reaches that point, it will simply float. And as a result, this method will separate your nanomaterials by buoyant density. And since Buoyant density, like all properties of nanomaterials, depends upon size and shape. This will allow you to separate your materials by those parameters. Now, it turns out in our early work, what we were able to do is to separate nanotubes, carbon nanotubes, by their diameter using this method. It turns out, though, as I suggested in the last slide, that diameter separation is not sufficient. You need to also be able to separate by the chiral angle. And as a result, you have to use some other trick to achieve separation by that parameter. And what you can use are the surfactants, uh, which also contribute to the buoyant density of your nanomaterial. And with appropriate choice of surfactant, you can separate by diameter or electronic type, metal versus semiconducting. You can separate multi-wall nanotubes by the number of walls, single wall, double wall, triple wall. You can even achieve an antimeric separation by using chiral surfactants. By that, I mean you can separate the right-handed from the left-handed carbon nanotubes via this method. <laughs> 
And so over the past decade or so, we've been able to isolate essentially any and all uh, nanotube chiralities via this method. What's nice about the method, though, is that it's completely general. While it works well for nanotubes, it works for essentially any nanomaterial that you like. Our next target was graphene. In this case, we're going to take graphite powders, disperse them in water using appropriate surfactants. When you sonicate, you're going to now get a mixture of single layer, bilayer, trilayer, multilayer graphene. In this case, for a two dimensional material, the buoyant density depends upon the thickness. And as a result, when you perform DGU, you now separate by the number of layers single layer, bilayer, trilayer graphene. In subsequent work, we tried to move on to other materials beyond carbon. This was a collaboration which included Laurie Marks and others at Northwestern. And in this case, uh, Chad Merkin's lab had developed a faceted gold nanoparticle solution, which was a mixture of rhombic dodecahedra and bipyramidal gold nanoparticles. If you look at the population here, you can see that the rhombic dodecahedra, which are these particles here, are smaller than the large bipyramidal particles. And this was important because gold, unlike carbon, has a relatively high buoyant density. And as a result, if you do DGU all the way to the isopicnic condition, you'll find all of your particles are sitting at the bottom of your centrifuge tube because their density exceeds that even of the highest density you can achieve with an aqueous solution. And as a result, in this case, we can no longer do equilibrium or isopicnic DGU, but rather transient DGU, where we capture the nanomaterials in their sedimentation regime. Sedimentation is driven most sensitively by the molecular weight. And as a result, large particles sediment more quickly than small particles. And consequently, we can see that this blue band here is highly enriched in the bipyramidal gold nanoparticles. The next target we had was to go after the so-called post-graphene two-dimensional nanomaterial, such as the transition metal dichalcogenized. And this has been the most challenging separation target for us in that these materials, like gold, have relatively high buoyant densities. And so if we use the same small molecule surfactants we use for graphene, these will also crash out to the bottom of your centrifuge tube. Operating in the sedimentation or transient regime doesn't get you anywhere, because that's most sensitive to molecular weight, which depends upon the lateral size as opposed to the thickness of these materials. Their properties are most sensitively dependent upon thickness. So the question is, how do you take something that's highly dense and pull its buoyant density artificially down into the range of an aqueous solution. And what you realize is that there's only one parameter left for you to play with, and that is the surfactants. And in particular, what I didn't note before, but it's true, is that these surfactants affiliate water with them strongly. And this so-called hydration layer will pull down the buoyant density of the nanomaterial itself. And as a result, if you increase the thickness of that hydration layer, which you can do using a much bulkier block copolymer surfactant, then you can pull down the buoyant density of your material. So the use of these so-called pleuronic block copolymers coupled with the, say, moly disulfide dispersion in this case, allows you now to pull the buoyant density into the range of your gradient. And as well, you see the same banding that you see with graphene, but now achieved with materials that have buoyant densities that are 2, 3, or 4x higher than carbon. And this result, I think, allows us now to have confidence that we can separate essentially any nanomaterial by size, shape, and therefore properties using this method. This method is one which I will note is industrially scalable. Nanointegris is a company that spun out of my lab in 2007. Uh, they commercialized metal and semiconducting carbon nanotube dispersions. Uh, Nathan Yoder, who is a PhD student of mine, became the CTO of this company and scaled up the process by 10,000 fold in 18 months. At that point, we stopped scaling up because we could produce 10x more material than the worldwide demand for these materials. We still have excess inventory if you're interested in buying. Uh, we have plenty of material to sell you. But basically, it became a business development problem over the past six or seven years. So they've now ramped up to about 700 customers in 40 countries. And with this type of customer base, uh, Nanotegris became a target for acquisition, which occurred in 2012. It's now owned by a larger company called Raymore. The bottom line is that we have plenty of monodispersed nanomaterials, and the question becomes, uh, what can we do with them? Are there some devices that perhaps could utilize these materials? So I'll give you some examples of where we've done this over the past few years. In the case of semiconducting carbon nanotubes, what we now have is a dispersion, which consists of a high-performance semiconducting electronic material. And as a result, you can imagine taking that dispersion and simply printing it onto a substrate using an aerosol jet or inkjet printer, and what you then have is a printed 
a channel material which could potentially compete with other printable electronic materials. And indeed, if we look at our printed circuits made out of semiconducting carbon nanotubes, uh, they have performance that exceeds all other printed electronic materials with the possible exception of amorphous oxides, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. I will note, though, that when you print in this manner, what you get is a random network or spaghetti-like matrix of your carbon nanotubes, which is a suboptimal geometry for a field effect transistor. And as a result, if you're a little bit more careful in the assembly using methods such as dielectrophoresis, you can drive the nanotubes to be aligned perfectly along the channel direction. You can do this in a manner which is self-aligned with an underlying gate. You can do this on channel lengths in the sub-100 nanometer regime. And under these conditions, you get ballistic transport across the channel. This allows you to achieve very high performance. In this case, we get frequencies of hundreds of kilohertz. In this case, we get frequencies of hundreds of gigahertz. And this becomes of high interest to industry and companies like IBM are now considering this for commercial applications. I will note uh, that because the nanotubes are in solution, we can also mix them with other materials. And that allows us to make so-called bulk heterojunctions, analogous to what is done in organic photovoltaics. In this case, we're taking a mixture of carbon nanotubes with a full arrange derivative known as PCBM, making that mixture. And that mixture can be utilized as a bulk heterojunction, all carbon-based solar cell. Uh, these solar cells with appropriately chosen chirality distribution have set the world record for all carbon-based solar cells. The last example here is one uh, where we're going to try to make actuators out of these materials. The concept is to take a carbon nanotube thin film, put it on a polymer, substrate and then use light to locally heat the carbon nanotubes. Since the carbon nanotubes have a different coefficient of thermal expansion than the polymer substrate upon heating, that will lead to stress in the film, which will lead to curling of the polymer film underneath. And that is seen here. You can see that half of these circular films have not curled, half have curled up halfway. And this is because we have two different chirality distributions in these two samples. And as a result, we've tuned the optical properties via chiral selection. So we can now tune the actuation wavelength for these optically driven actuators. In terms of the metallic carbon nanotubes, they are also uh, interesting for energy applications. Uh, obviously, you'd expect them to be more conductive than semiconducting nanotubes, which is true. And as a result, they are appropriate, uh, pro appropriately used as transparent conductors in photovoltaics or as conductive additives in composite materials, such as in this case where we're using them as additives in anode materials and lithium-ion batteries. The graphene, which I mentioned before, is also potentially interesting. In the early days, we tried to apply the graphene to the same applications as nanotubes, such as the channel material in a field effect transistor, or as a whole blocking layer or a transparent conductor in a photovoltaic cell. They work, uh, and I will note uh, that uh, they have a significant cost advantage compared to carbon nanotubes. But if you're really interested in performance, nanotubes will always be graphing. And so that's led us to de-emphasize uh, the utilization of graphing as a semiconducting material. Instead, we recognize the fact that it's a zero band gap semiconductor, or better thought of as a metal, in my opinion. And as a result, uh, where you'd use that instead is perhaps as a support for photocatalysis. In this particular application, the concept is that if you load a titania nanoparticle on a graphene support, and then you shine light on the titania, which would create an exciton on the titania, the presence of the graphene sheet will extract the electron from the exciton, thereby splitting the exciton, leaving the hole behind on the titania, which is then available to do oxidative chemistry, whereas the electron on the graphene is available to do reductive chemistry. And as a result, graphene additives to titania will enhance photocatalytic conversion efficiencies by about 50% in the case of oxidative reactions and up to an order of magnitude in reductive reactions. I'll note that this particular technology is one uh, that the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern has looked at as a potential replacement material for Brita filters. And so we're exploring that as a water purification scheme. The other place you can use graphene is as a simple conductor. And in particular, what graphene offers as a conductor is mechanical flexibility. The key, though, is that you want to be able to print this in the same way that we're printing the nanotubes. And this requires you to tune the viscosity of the solution to match that of your favorite printing method. For example, for inkjet printing, there's a very narrow viscosity range over which you'll get effective printing. 
The way we're able to tune that viscosity is to use a polymer stabilizer known as ethyl cellulose. And if you get this just right, you can print beautiful lines. The lines are highly conductive. And you can see here that you can flex them. And if you cycle them over hundreds of bending cycles, you see essentially no change in the conductivity. This attracted immediate interest from industry. Sigma Aldrich has since uh, commercialized this. You can buy this uh, from Sigma Aldrich today. It's selling as quickly as we can produce it. What you find, though, is that when you start talking to industry, inkjet printing is not their favorite printing method. They would prefer a more scalable roll-to-roll -roll printing method, such as gravure printing or screen printing. And so again, utilizing the ethyl cellulose stabilizer, we can tune the viscosity of our solutions over multiple orders of magnitude and dial it right in for gravure printing, as we did in this case, or dial it in for screen printing, as we did in this case. Both the gravure and screen printing inks will also be distributed by Sigma Aldrich shortly. I suspect this will be a much larger market. If you simply look at carbon inks used in screen printing of glucose sensors, it's about a billion dollar market today. Okay, so as I alluded to at the start of my talk, you can play this game for a few years, keep improving purity, get improved performance, but as your purities approach 100%, you asymptotically approach some limit in all these device applications. And we've essentially reached that limit. And so we're stuck. Uh, we either have to move on and do something different or come up with a way of taking this library of nanomaterials instead of using them in isolation to reassemble them into more sophisticated heterostructures. And this is an exercise in integration. And so let me show you uh, an attempt to move up the so-called value chain. So I showed you before individual transistors made out of carbon nanotubes. I was telling you their mobilities and on-off ratios were competitive with essentially any other printed electronic material. But the reality is that a simple field effect transistor is not that useful. You need to be able to integrate it into an integrated circuit. And in particular, the winning strategy for the past 50 plus years is so-called CMOS or complementary logic technology. And so the question is, can you realize CMOS with these carbon nanotube printed transistors. To do that, you have to be able to control doping. You have to be able to have P-type devices and N-type devices. It turns out that you can achieve N-type doping in carbon nanotubes using a reducing agent known as benzyl biologen, which is also solution processable and printable. But it's actually not good enough. I can show you dozens of papers in the literature that have both P-type and N-type transistors, and yet they have terrible power dissipation in their logic circuits because they haven't appropriately tuned the threshold voltage. And so the way you tune threshold voltage in a transistor is to also consider the gate metal, which is in this case nickel, and the dielectric alumina. And when you get it all right, what you achieve is beautiful separation of the threshold voltages for your P-channel and your N-channel devices. In particular, what you need for low power CMOS is a so-called enhancement mode device. By that I mean the P-type devices need to have a negative threshold voltage and the n-type devices need to have a positive threshold voltage. And you can see that's precisely what we've achieved here. You also need these threshold voltages to be equally distributed, about zero, and as low voltage as possible, to have low uh, voltage uh, for your supply in these circuits. So here we have threshold voltages of about plus or minus one. In this case, if we now make a logic gate, uh, well, there'll be no current path from supply to ground in steady state, which should give us ultra low power consumption. So does it work? Uh, yes, if we make an inverter is the simple example, and we can make more sophisticated devices such as NAND and NOR gates. But for the case of an inverter, we can see that the devices work, firstly. In an inverter, if you put a low voltage in, such as zero, you should get a high voltage out. And that voltage should match your supply, which in this case is 0.8 volts. So we see we get full rail-to-rail -rail voltage swing. On the other hand, if you put a high voltage in, such as 0.8, you should get a low voltage out, i.e. zero. The fact that you have a rail-to-rail -rail voltage swing is actually unprecedented in carbon nanotube-based electronics since the threshold voltages are never appropriately tuned. What this also implies is that you get very low power consumption. If we look at a power dissipation in steady state, we see that we have about 0.1 nanowatts power dissipation. Even in the switching regime, we have less than a nanowatt. This is about a thousand-fold lower than all previous nanotube uh, CMOS devices. And because we have rail-to-rail -rail voltage swing, we can now cascade uh, these devices. And that will allow us to make increasingly complicated circuits, and we'll soon be releasing a 1,000-bit SRAM uh, built on carbon nanotubes. There is a catch, though. And the catch is that our benzyl biology and N-type dopant has limited air stability. 
There's two ways around that. One is to develop encapsulation schemes, and we're working on that. I think that's actually a solvable problem. The other way around it is to acknowledge the fact that nanotubes would rather be p-type and use some other material as the n-type. So for example, in this collaboration with Ananth Dadalapur at UT Austin, we're going to now use the nanotubes as the p-type material and zinc tin oxide, or ZTO, as a inkjet printable n-type material. These materials are now naturally P and N type, no encapsulation needed. Works beautifully. You get rail to rail voltage swing. You get reasonable operating speeds up to 700 kilohertz or so. This obviously is not as good as single crystal silicon, but it's quite fast for a printable electronic material. What I like about this particular technology, though, is that because the nanotubes in ZTO are so stable and reproducible, is that you can quickly move up the value chain instead of having simple ring oscillator circuits, you can build more sophisticated uh, logic circuits, such as D flip-flops. You see this has a dozen or so uh, transistors in it. Basically, you can see the first paper I was published in 2014, as was the next one, because the first try it works. It's a very reliable, reproducible technology. The other thing you can do when you have stable P and N type materials is begin to layer them into header structures. This is a bilayer header structure where we have zinc tin oxide and on top of that, nanotubes. And in this first demonstration, to illustrate that both materials are active, we're going to connect them both to the source drain electrodes. And what that implies is that you have parallel p-type and n-type conduction pathways, which will imply that your transistor is an ambipolar device. And you can see that here. We have both p- and n-type behavior, which is shown by this uh, V-shaped uh, transfer curve. That, I think, is a cute demonstration. It shows that it works. But it's not that interesting in that you can achieve ambipolar transport in many ways, including just with nanotubes alone. And so that led us to think, is there something else we could do in a bilayer header structure that would be more unique? That led us to another uh, n-type nanomaterial known as molybdenum disulfide. Lincoln Lahan mentioned this a bit yesterday. From our perspective, molybdenum disulfide represents an n-type material with reasonable mobilities and on-off ratios that nicely complement carbon nanotube thin films. These materials are naturally n-type. You don't need to dope them. They are just n-type in air happily. And it led to the supposition that you could just layer these as we did with the ZTO and nanotubes. But instead of wiring up them in parallel as we did to make the ambipolar transistor, let's wire them up in a, a vertical geometry to make a PN heterojunction diode. And so that was what we did. Uh, in our first study, we utilized so-called scotch tape molybdenum disulfide, which is shown here. On top of that, we deposited nanotube thin films, which were patterned. This created a PN heterojunction diode. And if you measure the IV curve from this diode, you see that it has a rectifying IV curve, as you learn in uh, freshman level circuits, i.e., if you put a positive voltage in, you get a high current out. If you put a negative voltage in, you get almost no current out. So that's fine. What's interesting, though, is that because the constituent materials are atomically thin, if you now apply a gate voltage to the system, the gate voltage will not only gate the material which is in contact with the dielectric, in this case, molybdenum disulfide, but because that material is atomically thin, the electric field will penetrate through that molybdenum disulfide and concurrently modulate the carrier concentration on the p-type side of your p-n heterojunction diode. And what that leads to is a gate tunability over the carrier concentration and therefore a gate tunability over the diode characteristics. And what this allows you to do is to tune the rectification ratio by five orders of magnitude, whereas in this case, we have a high rectification ratio. You can see in the pink curve here that there's almost no rectification that occurs. Furthermore, if you go to another biasing regime, you can shut the device off completely. So you can qualitatively change the transport between an insulator, a resistor, and a diode just by applying a gate voltage. If instead you look at this as a three-terminal device, what you observe is that at low gate voltage, the device is on, but at high negative or high positive voltage, the device is off, since you're fully depleting the N and P type sides of the junction, respectively. And what this implies is that we have a new type of IV curve, a so-called anti-ambipolar transfer curve, which is the opposite of the ambipolar curve that I showed you a few slides back. And this anti-ambipolarity, to our knowledge, is unprecedented in solid-state electronics. I'll note that these materials, the nanotubes and the molybdenum sulfide, are direct band gap semiconductors. And as a result, you may anticipate that they would be sensitive to light. And that is true. 
in the scanning photocurrent microscopy image taken in the lab of Lincoln Mahan, we can see that in the junction regime, we see a photocurrent. You'll note that it's not particularly homogeneous. There's work to be done to get this better, but the fact of the matter is that it works. And if we look at the spectral response, we see that both the nanotubes and the molydisulfide are participating. So it's a two-color photodiode enabled by this unique geometry. So that's interesting. Uh, the problem, though, is that, as I alluded to before, the molydisulfide is created by scotch tape methods, which I would argue is not a scalable manufacturing method. And as a result, the question is, can this anti-ambipolar concept be realized with materials that are already available in large quantities and can be processed at wafer scale using solution-based methods? And so that led us back to oxides, in particular indium gallium zinc oxide, which is a n-type amorphous oxide semiconductor developed in our materials research center by Tobin Marks uh, et al. And if we look at the characteristics of IGZO, you'll see that it has the same mobility and essentially the same on-off ratio as molyde sulfide. So it looks promising as a replacement for MOS2 in this particular uh, novel device. So we proceed now to spin coat on the entire wafer, the indium gallium zinc oxide. We then subsequently spin coat everywhere, our carbon nanotubes, and then we pattern them simply via photolithography. This can be done in a massively scalable way. You can produce hundreds of devices with no problem. You also note now that we're using a thin a half nia based dielectric as opposed to a thick silicon dioxide dielectric. That's going to lower our voltage operation. In the previous devices, it was operating at tens of volts, which I would say is not very practical. Whereas here, you're going to see operation in the single volt regime. Here's the data. If we look at these now carbon nanotube IGZO heterojunctions, you see the same anti-ambipolarity we saw before. In particular, if we look at this uh, log linear plot of the transfer curve, the green curve is the nanotube IGZO uh, junction. We can see it's a nice anti-ambipolar response, low voltage operation. And if you look at the linear plot, you can see clearly that we have regions of positive and negative slope, or so-called positive and negative transconductance. You also know that the on-off ratio of these devices is 10 to the fourth, uh, which is about 10 to the fourth higher than graphene-based ambipolar devices, uh, which have previously been utilized for the next application that I'll show you in the next slide. In particular, when you have this nice anti-ambipolar transfer curve, you can now realize a variety of communication circuits straightforwardly, such as a frequency doubler. So how a frequency doubler works is you load into your uh, circuit an AC signal. And you can see the AC signal's DC offset is set to the peak of your anti-ambipolar curve. What this implies is that half of the signal sees a positive transconductance and is faithfully transmitted through the anti-ambipolar junction, whereas the bottom half of the sine wave sees a negative transconductance, which flips its sine by 180 degrees. And if you take a sine wave and flip half of it by 180 degrees, you've effectively doubled its frequency. This is the input, and that's the output. What's more interesting, though, is that if you tune off of the peak in your anti-ambipolar curve, you can achieve more sophisticated signal conditioning. And this can be used for more sophisticated communication circuits, such as phase shift keen and frequency shift keen circuits that are widely used in Wi-Fi technology. I'll note that these circuits are obviously used. Wi-Fi we have in the room here today. But to realize the same function will require seven or eight CMOS transistors where we can do this with one anti-ambipolar transistor. So there's a possibility here to lower device count or, in effect, increase device function. So with that, I know I'm out of time. I want to quickly summarize what I tried to convince you today is that chemical refinement adds significant value in nanoscience. It allows you to achieve highly monodispersed populations and therefore reproducible performance. And that allows you to move up the value chain. Instead of doing single one-off devices and a research lab, you can commercialize technologies and get reproducible performance. And I've shown you many such applications today. Uh, there are others I didn't have time to discuss, uh, which I'll be happy to discuss offline if you're interested. And with that, let me conclude by introducing uh, my research group, uh, thanking all of them uh, for their work. I tried to highlight collaborators throughout the talk. I hope you noticed those names as we went through this very abbreviated presentation. And finally, thank uh, the funding agencies and you for your attention.
Yeah. So one thing you can do is have nanotubes with the same electronic properties. So a semiconductor semiconductor contact or a metal metal contact will be orders of magnitude uh, lower resistance than a metal semiconductor contact. So that's step one. Once you have your monitor dispersed nanomaterials, so then you will be limited still because nanotubes are one dimensional. And so when you go from this tube to that tube, you need to have a big momentum change, which leads to scattering. It needs to be mediated by some phonon. And as a result, you're kind of stuck. If you have metallic nanotubes, you can do a so-called local nano soldering. By that, I mean you can introduce a metal precursor that will be decomposed at a hot point. Of course, the junction will be the hottest point. You can sort of solder that junction together. That, of course, is not an effective strategy for semiconducting tubes because it will lead to screening in your channel. So that's a, I would say, fundamental limitation and why the mobilities have plateaued at 100 or so centimeters squared per volt second in the random geometry. The way you go better is to go parallel. And that's what I showed you. Instead of getting hundreds of kilohertz, I get hundreds of gigahertz operation when I go parallel because I've eliminated the path, uh, which is restricting current flow. Okay, that's going to fly for the bench. All right, thank you.